the Odyssey, starting on page 138, the chapter, Odysseus the Beggar. But Odysseus had a powerful friend as well. Athena was determined to help him back to his rightful place. When she saw him asleep on the beach in Ithaca, she knew he was in danger. If the suitors found him on his own, they were sure to kill him. She had to keep him away from the pl palace until he figured out how to defeat them. As a start, she covered the beach with a magic mist. When Odysseus woke up, he didn't recognize the place. He thought the Phaeacians had tricked him and taken him somewhere else. They've stranded me in a strange country, he muttered angrily, and stolen all my treasure. But then he looked around and saw the treasure heaped up under an olive tree. So what had happened? Where was he? He was still wondering when Athena came sauntering onto the beach, disguised as a shepherd boy. She greeted him cheerfully. Who are you? She said. What are you doing here? Odysseus had no idea who the shepherd boy was, so he lied about his name and started telling a false story. Athena threw back her head and laughed. Don't you know me? Don't you recognize your own land of Ithaca? Waving her hand, she lifted the mist, and Odysseus realized who she was. He fell to his knees with a cry of joy. Goddess, you have always been kind to me. Now you need my help again, Athena said. Your palace is full of men who want to marry your wife and kill your son. If you go there on your own, they'll kill you too. What should I do? asked Odysseus. Go and find Emmaus, your swineherd, Athena said. He'll let you stay in his hut until I bring Telemachus to you. But it's best if Emmaus doesn't know who you are. She reached out her stick and touched Odysseus on the shoulder. <coughs> Immediately, his smooth skin creased into wrinkles. His thick, curly hair grew thin and straggling and turned gray. The fine clothes King Alcinous had given him were transformed into beggar's rags. Athena handed him a shabby knapsack and a rough wooden staff. Off to the swineherd's hut, she said. Wait there for Telemachus. He's away on a voyage, but I'll fetch him home. As she sped off, Odysseus hid his treasure. Then he trudged up the rough track to Eumaeus's hut. The swineherd was sitting outside with his dogs, and when they saw Odysseus, they flew at him, barking wildly, and they would have attacked him if Eumaeus hadn't called them off. You're lucky I was here, he said. Come into my hut and recover, old man. He gave Odysseus bread to eat while he prepared a meal. It won't be much, he said ruefully. All the best pigs go to those greedy suitors in the palace. Now that my master's dead and gone, they spend the whole day feasting there and guzzling his wine. Is your master really dead? Odysseus said carefully. Who was he? He's probably a skeleton by now. He may have shook his head sadly. He went off to the war in Troy 20 years ago. Never came back. Oh, my noble master, how I miss him. Tell me his name, Odysseus said. I fought in that war too. I might be able to give you some news. I know that kind of news, you may have said bitterly. Every beggar who comes here has some tale to tell Penelope, my mistress. She's so desperate for news of her husband that she listens to them all. And then she showers them with gifts, which is what they were after, of course. I'd like to hear the story of your adventures, stranger, but no lies about Odysseus. Odysseus found it hard not to say who he was, but he obeyed Athena's instructions. He invented a story about travels in Egypt. Then Eumaeus made him up a bed beside the fire. So Odysseus spent his first night back in Ithaca in a swineherd's hut with Eumaeus' old cloak over him to keep out the cold. Meanwhile, Athena was speeding towards Sparta to bring Telemachus home. When she arrived there, she appeared to him in a vision. Why are you still in Sparta, Telemachus? She said. You've left your mother unguarded and your treasures too. And now those evil suitors are plotting to kill you. They're going to ambush your ship as you sail past the island of Asteris. How can I escape, said Telemachus. Don't anchor at Asteris for the night, Athena told him. Travel on through the dark until you reach Ithaca, but don't stay on your ship while it sails into the harbor. Get your sailors to drop you off before that at the first headland, then go straight to Eumaeus's hut. You can trust him. Telemachus was wide awake now and anxious to go home. As soon as it was morning, he said goodbye to Menelaus and Helen, and they sent him on his way with many treasures. He was about to leave when a great eagle came flying across the sky, carrying a fat goose from someone's farmyard. That's a sign from the gods, cried Helen joyfully. As that eagle came down from the mountains and pounced on the fat goose, so Odysseus will return and swoop down on the wicked suitors who are fattening themselves in your palace. May that be true, Telemachus said fervently. He said farewell and set off as fast as he could, ordering his ship to put to sea immediately. Athena gave them a following wind, and they sailed steadily until sunset. As night fell, the island of Asteris came into view, and the sailors looked at Telemachus, expecting orders to land. But Telemachus had not forgotten Athena's warning. We sail on, he told the sailors. There's no time to rest. 
Obediently, they kept a straight course until Emeka stared into the darkness, wondering what fate was in store for him. Would he reach home alive, or would he be caught by the evil suitors? Early the next morning, when Odysseus and Eumaeus were preparing their breakfast in the hut, the dogs began to bark loudly. There's someone coming, Odysseus said. Eumaeus went to the door and gave a cry of joy. Telemachus, light of my eyes, you're safe. Come in. Walking into the hut, Telemachus saw the ragged beggar inside. Greetings, stranger, he said politely. Our visitor's a real traveler, Eumaeus said. I've done my best to entertain him, but now that you're home, you can give him a proper welcome. How can I invite him to my house, Telemachus said ruefully. Think about those wicked suitors will insult him. He sat down on a heap of branches next to Odysseus. Good, Eumaeus, please go and tell my mother I'm home, but make sure no one else hears you. Trust me, Eumaeus said, putting on his sandals. He set off straight away. As soon as he was out of sight, Athena came to the door of the hut in the shape of a tall and beautiful woman. She stood out of sight of Telemachus, where only Odysseus and the dogs could see her. The dogs whimpered and ran off to the far side of the farmyard. Glancing up, Odysseus met Athena's eyes and knew at once who she was. Muttering an excuse to Telemachus, he stood up and slipped out of the hut. Athena led him away from the door. Noble Odysseus, she said, the time has come to tell Telemachus everything. Then the two of you must decide how to get rid of these wicked suitors who are ruining Ithaca. Go back inside and greet your son. She waved her staff. Immediately Odysseus' disguise was stripped away. His body straightened, his hair and beard were thick and dark again, and his wrinkles disappeared. The beggar's stinking rags were replaced by fresh, clean clothes. When he stepped back into the hut, Telemachus looked up and gasped. Stranger, who are you? He said in an awed voice. Only the gods can change like that. Have mercy on me. I'm no god, said Odysseus. I'm your father, Telemachus. Telemachus stared and then flung his arms around Odysseus's neck in tears of joy. Quickly, Odysseus gave an account of his adventures and how he'd come to be in Eumaeus' hut. And now there's work to do, he finished. You and I must get rid of these suitors who are devouring our island. If only we could, Telemachus said. I know you're a great warrior, father, but there are over a hundred suitors. How can we fight so many men on our own? We're not on our own, said Odysseus. Athena's on our side. So is Zeus himself, the father of gods and men. Isn't that enough help for you? The gods are powerful allies, said Telemachus, but I still don't see how two men can defeat a hundred enemies. That's what we're going to figure out now, Odysseus said. Listen, lowering his voice, he began to explain his plan. Down in the town, Eumaeus took his message to Penelope, but there was no hope of keeping it secret. The returning sailors were already spreading the news. Telemachus is alive, they shouted as they came up from the harbor. The suitors were furious, and so was Penelope. As soon as Eumaeus was gone, she swept down from her room in a rage. What kind of men are you, she said to the suitors. You're all guests here, living at Odysseus' expense, and now you've tried to kill his son? The suitors swore it wasn't true. All we want is for you to choose another husband, they said. She keep putting us off. First you wouldn't choose until Telemachus was a man, and now you're pretending to weave a shroud. I am weaving, Penelope said fiercely. But one of her maids had betrayed her. Every night you unpick your weaving, said an angry suitor. We know what you're doing, Penelope. You can't delay any longer. It's time to choose. They all clamored at her until she came back up to her room in tears. Much as she loathed the idea, she had to do what they demanded. She couldn't see any escape from the situation. She didn't know that Odysseus and Telemachus were in the swineherd's hut at that very moment, plotting how to rescue her. By the time Eumaeus returned to the hut, Athena had changed Odysseus back into an old beggar, and the old beggar insisted that he wanted to visit the palace in the morning. Telemachus pretended to be impatient with him. Well, I'm much too busy to take you in. You'll have to wait until Eumaeus is ready. That suits me fine, croaked Odysseus. I'd rather wait till it warms up a little. These frosty mornings are no good for my old bones. So first thing in the morning, Telemachus set off to the palace on his own, leaving the other two to trail along behind. King Odysseus went back to his palace dressed in rags and leaning on a stick. He looked so old and dirty that the goat herd shouted abuse at him as he came past with the goats. What are you doing, you greasy old plate licker? Are you heading to town to grovel around for scraps? Why don't you try a bit of honest work? Odysseus was itching to give him a crack on the head with a stick, but that would have ruined his plan. He put up patiently with the insults, hobbling on down the path until he and Eumaeus came inside of the palace. You go in first, Odysseus said. I'll follow behind you. As he spoke, there was a movement on the far side of the courtyard, over by the dung heap. Catching the sound of Odysseus's voice, an old, old dog lifted his head and began to wag his tail, but he couldn't get up and walk toward them. He was too weak to move. When Odysseus saw the dog, his eyes filled with tears. What's a lovely dog like that doing on the dung heap? He muttered. 
Ah, uh, that's Argus. Odysseus's old dog. You may have said he used to be a marvelous hunting dog, but the heart went out of him when Odysseus sailed away. He stalked off into the palace, and the old dog lowered his head and slumped back onto the dung heap. Odysseus hurried toward him, but he was too late. The light faded from the old dog's eyes before Odysseus could reach him. He had managed to hang on just long enough to see his master again, and now he was dead. Sadly, Odysseus walked into the great hall of the palace. The suitors were feasting and listening to music, and he began to go from table to table begging for scraps of food. Some of the suitors gave him bread and meat from their plates, but some of them just insulted him. We've got enough beggars around already, said one. Can't you spare me a little piece of bread, Odysseus said. After all, you're getting it free. The suitor was outraged. He picked up a wooden stool and threw it hard, hitting Odysseus in the back. A weaker man would have been knocked off his feet. Odysseus stayed steady, but that was only the first attack. Another beggar appeared in the hall doorway, a greedy hulk of a man called Iris. He was furious to see a rival beggar in the hall, and he charged at Odysseus, intending to throw him out. A fight! A fight! The suitor shouted in delight. Let's see who's the best wrestler. They jumped up and crowded around, egging Iris on and cheering drunkenly as Odysseus tucked up his rags. Odysseus knew he could win easily, but he chose not to hurt Iris too much. He beat him just enough to make his nose bleed, which raised a cheer from the suitors, and then dumped him outside the hall. At that moment, Penelope appeared, coming slowly down the stairs. She looked so beautiful that all the suitors stopped shouting and fell silent, feeling as though their bones were melting. Each of them remembered all over again why he was there and how much he wanted to marry her. Penelope went over to Telemachus. You shouldn't let them treat your guests like that, she whispered, pointing to Odysseus. How can I control the suitors? Telemachus murdered muttered. Penelope was still watching Odysseus. He may be only a beggar, she murmured, but he's under our protection, and maybe he has news about your father. I'll speak with him this evening when the suitors have gone. Telemachus went over to tell Odysseus, and the suitors came crying around Penelope, paying her compliments and competing for her attention. With a sigh, she turned to face them. Don't waste your breath on flattery, she said. The only praise I valued was from Odysseus, but I can see those days are over. All I can do now is obey his wishes. The suitors stopped talking, wondering what she was going to say. Penelope sighed again. Before Odysseus went away to Troy, he warned me that he might be killed. He said if he didn't come back, I should marry again when Telemachus was a man. Now the hall was completely silent. Penelope drew a long breath, stating her voice. The time's come, she said. Tomorrow I shall do as Odysseus wanted and choose a new husband. The suitors were jubilant. As Penelope walked back upstairs, they went home for the night, celebrating drunkenly. Tomorrow one of them would be Penelope's new husband. That was what they thought. But Odysseus had other plans. As soon as all the suitors had gone, he and Telemachus moved around the hall by torchlight. They cleared away all the armor and weapons that were stacked against the walls and locked them in the storeroom. Tomorrow there would be no weapons in the hall except their own. With every last sword and helmet, when every last sword and helmet was gone, Telemachus went off to his own room for the night, and Odysseus settled down beside the fire. As soon as he was on his own, Penelope came down from her room again, accompanied by Eurycleia, the old nurse. Sit here with me, she said to Odysseus, and tell me about your voyages. Have you heard news of my husband on your travels? Odysseus longed to tell her who he was, but he had to get rid of the suitors first. So to comfort her, he made up a tale about meeting Odysseus in Crete. And he's on his way home now, he finished, before the month is over. He'll be here with you, I swear it. If only I could believe that, Penelope sighed. But I've promised to choose a new husband tomorrow. I'm going to challenge the suitors to string Odysseus's great bow. If one of them can do that and shoot an arrow through the loops of ten bronze axes, he'll be my next husband. Her idea fitted in perfectly with Odysseus's plan. He nodded approvingly. Keep to what you've decided, he said. Before the contest is over, Odysseus will be here to rescue you. Penelope shook her head and stood up. We shall see, she said sadly. Meanwhile, you're welcome in my palace. Your clay will bring you some water so that you can wash. She went back to her room and your clay came bustling over with a bowl of water. Kneeling down, she began to wash Odysseus's dusty feet. As she dried them, her fingers touched an old scar on his leg. Her hands stopped moving, and she froze for a moment. Then with trembling fingers, she parted his rags to look at the scar. It was a long, pale ridge where an old wound had healed. You got that in a boar hunt, she whispered, when you were just a boy. Slowly, she looked up at his face. I lost my place. Oh, my dear master, she said. Hush, Odysseus put a finger to his lips. Keep my secret if you want me to drive out those wicked suitors. I will, Eurycleia said grimly. They've corrupted the maids and almost ruined this island. They all deserve to be punished. Tomorrow they will be, said Odysseus. Then he settled down beside the hearth, staring into the fire and waiting for morning to come.